All right, we are getting started. If you are looking for Tax Tuesday, you're in the right spot. Let me see if I can see. All right, people are flowing in. That's fantastic. I have a floating counter. I figure out one of these days how to make that. Stop doing that. All right. So, hey, guys, if you're looking for Tax Tuesday, you're in the right spot. My name is Toby Mathis. I'm joined by Jeff Webb. And uh, if you're looking for some answers to tax questions, you're in the right spot. We're, we're, we're hoping to find some answers, too. So hopefully you guys can help us because we have a really good community out there in the chat land. And uh, it'll just go over some uh, some ground rules here. But this is Tax Tuesday, uh, probably 200 plus episodes at this point been doing this for a number of years and uh it's one of those weird things you know you don't get paid for it but you like doing it so you just keep doing it and everybody says why do you keep doing it but you say because it's fun and uh, because we like doing it now we have a whole team behind us you got dutch elliot jared tanya troy with with uh, amanda and patty and matt in the background i'm probably missing people alicia i think it's going to be on one of our tax professionals so we have a whole bunch of people to answer your questions. And those are a lot of tax professionals. You have a bunch of CPAs and tax attorneys in that bunch. So feel free to ask your questions. But here's the deal. Ask your question in the Q&A. Because that way it doesn't go when you have 100 people responding to a question like this question. Where are you sitting right now today? What city and state? And if you say I'm in Seattle and I'm drunk, that's not what I'm asking for. It's Seattle, Washington. Right. There's Cary, North Carolina, but put it in the chat. Olympia, Washington. All right. We like, we got some Washington the house. There's Princeton, New Jersey, Connecticut, Phoenix, Arizona, Lexington, Kentucky. Whoa. California, Santa Monica, Sacramento, San Jose, Castle Rock, Washington, Auburn, Washington. Know that well. Uh, next to Puyallup, uh, Alexandria. Let's see. Rolling Hills, the States, Austin, Northern California. Okay. They're going too fast now. I try to keep up. But that's what you go, Bellevue, Washington, know that area very well too. San Antonio, Texas was just in Kerrville, know that area. There's Hollandale Beach, which two weeks ago was in Miami, so know that area well. Went to the Yellow Green Farmer's Market in Hollywood, you got to do it. Then go to Pura Tinto Coffee. It's some friends of ours uh, from Colombia that get the best coffee in the world right there. Uh, there's Sherry. Hey, Sherry. Nice to see you again. Polsbo. Oh, my gosh. You're the Vikings over there in the Polsbo, Washington. Uh, anyway, so we have people from all over the place. Sherry says she's been gone. Hopefully, it's good travel. Hopefully, you guys, and if you don't realize this, I read the chat right in front of me here. If you see my eyes go off, it's because I'm reading chat and questions. And a lot of you folks have known for years and they become friends. We go out to dinner when they show up. Like some people are like, Hey, I'm going to be in town. It's like so much fun. And so, yeah, we have a good time and we like to, we, we, we like the people that uh, we're able to serve in some capacity. So it's like, this is fun. Whether you're clients or not, it doesn't matter. You can ask questions. Um, so if you have questions that come up in between sessions, because we do this every two weeks, by all means, uh, send it at tax Tuesday at andersonadvisors.com. So uh, tax Tuesday at andersonadvisors.com. You could send in a question. If you start asking questions about all your stuff, you know, we got the North Shore of Oahu over there, Turtle Bay, right? Oof. Um, if we have, we have people all over the place. So they're still putting in there. And we got, we're, we're really stretching the map this time. I'm kind of uh, kind of jealous though, Kim, if she's over in Oahu right now. Um, Anyway, if you have a, a question that's really specific to you, we may ask that you become a client at some point. Say, hey, can't just answer uh, specific things about filling out your tax return and things like that. But if it's general questions, we're absolutely willing to help you. And if you're a platinum client, you already get to ask all the questions you want. We're going to answer them even if they're specific to you. So uh, just, you know, hopefully you guys can honor that. All right, let's jump in. We got a bunch of questions that we're going to go over. All right, let's see what we got. When dissolving a C corporation with a single shareholder and having a net operating loss, does the loss go on the shareholder's personal return and can the loss be offset against personal income? Great question, and we will answer it. I jointly, uh, I jointly own an inherited property that is currently on the market. Can the expenses that I have, utilities, staging, maintenance, repairs, taxes, be added to the cost value? Probably the basis, right? Mm -hmm. We will answer that. My wife's father wants to sign his house over to us and her brother. What tax advantage is that to her dad? And what tax issues does it raise for us? Should we start an LLC or some other structure? Great 
question. And the best time to ask that question is before dad does something that he can't undo, right? Um, when you have a C Corp, no income at this point, a Wyoming LLC that owns two LLCs with rentals, which entity pays for general expenses like membership, cell phone, internet, education, et cetera? Again, really great questions all the way across the board so far. Elliot picked these out. So Elliot, good job, buddy. Um, how does paying your child under 18 help with tax, if any? Again, really good questions that uh, will we'll be able to help a lot of folks today, I'm, I'm sure. Can you benefit from cost segregation at any time? For example, after 25 years on a 27 and a half year property as an extreme? Question mark. What is the downside of doing it sooner than later, given bonus depreciation is reducing annually at this point and will go away entirely? Is it going to go away entirely? Mm. I think it's always, what is it going to be at? It's going to so, be all the way up to that 27 and a half years. Yeah. Well, bonus depreciation is going to. Oh, bonus depreciation went away. Uh, it's 80% in 23 and 60%, 60 next and year. Forty, And then maybe it goes away in 2026, right? Oh, wait. This is, they, they put you, you small font. They're taunting me. All right. Need to move from so yeah, Jeff and I both. This is bad. Need to move from sole proprietorship to some form of business entity. I'm an active trader doing well and want to protect my account as well as provide the best solution for retirement contributions and charitable contributions. C Corp, something else, fully happy breaking even or even leaving money in the corp for future purposes. Good question. I am I currently own a home in one state, Oregon. I'm I am looking to purchase an investment property in another state and plan to do so using an LLC or S Corp. I eventually would like to make my investment property Arizona my primary residence and my current residence an investment property. What would be the easiest way to go about this? Well, we'll answer that. These are good questions, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. So like again, uh we owe you a beer, Elliot, if you drink beer or wine or soda pop. I think uh, Jeff will give you a diet Mountain Dew. Mm. They should be a sponsor. If I invested $30,000 in a marketing class to start a marketing company, do I have to amortize it over 15 years to see any of it back? Can it be a business investment and get it all back? Interesting way to put it, but we will answer that. Is 1245 property subject to depreciation recapture if the rental property is sold with capital gain? Really good questions all the way around. And I noticed there were no questions that took up the entire page. You know what? I like that. All right, let's dive into these. Before we do, just know that some of these answers you may find sitting on, uh, on my YouTube channel, which some of you guys may be streaming on the YouTube channel, in which case you have Troy moderating for you. Way to go, Troy, in our office. He's a, he, he oversees all of our bookkeepers. Uh, but you can absolutely go in and, uh, and, and subscribe, and it's free. And all of the Tax Tuesdays get updated, uh, get recorded, and put onto my YouTube channel so you can listen to them later in case you have insomnia. All right. Um, tax and asset protection workshop, my partner and I, Clint Coons, gosh, we've been doing these since 1999, Holy cow. <laughs> just, just for a minute. And, uh, we are doing a bunch of virtual ones. And then in December 7th through the 10th, we have a four day live version where first day is infinity day. If you like investing and then three days, yeah, I was 12 when I started. That's about right. Sherry, it's more accurate than you realize um <laughs> but we four-day event you come out to vegas we're going to be at the virgin hotel casino which is the old hard rock and they revamped it put a new uh wrapper on it and uh it's a lot of fun and it's four days and you get to hang out with a lot of cool people who are all investors and i think that's probably my favorite part plus you get to hang out with us because guess what we like to wander around and talk to everybody because it's like a big old family. It's people always show up. They always, and, and they're, we're always looking for nuggets. I love the, the nut, I love the nugget hunters that have been to, you know, dozen of these things and they love to show up and they share. And it's just a really good community. Way, way, way cool. If you like being around nice people who want you to succeed and who don't have like, they're not, you know, you're not going to get hit with a million different offers. 
from a million different vendors. We just teach it. And there's two sides to Anderson. We have the infinity side, which we teach people how to make money. And we have the tax and asset protection side where we teach you how to keep it, preserve it, and then pass it on a loving, caring way to your family or to your organizations you care about. And uh, you can absolutely do that. Uh, there's the YouTube link. Um, we'll send that link out to you too. You just type in Toby Mathis and in YouTube and you'll find us. All right, let's get to these questions. When dissolving a C corporation, Jeff, with a single shareholder and you have a net operating loss, so you lost money, never made money, does the loss go on the shareholder's personal return and can the loss be offset against personal income? And the answer is no, but however. Uh, no, because that C corporation is its own entity. It has no attachment up to you. Um, so the loss is generated in that C corp stay in that C corp, even when you dissolve it. Now, the however portion is, is you probably finance some of those losses. I get a 1202 or a 1244. 1244. So you have shareholder loans that we can convert to common stock. Uh, anything you invest in the company that you don't get back is first off going to be a capital loss to you. Mm -hmm. However, like you mentioned, that 1244 allows you to deduct up to $50,000 if you're single or $100,000 if you're married filing jointly of those losses from that corporation. And I believe all our corporations are set up with 1244 provision. Yeah, we may come on every single case. And so what Jeff is talking about is there's a statute that says for C corporations, I mean, it's, it's C and S. I don't think you have I've to worry never, about it. I, it is CNS, but I've never seen it actually apply it, to us. It has to be a corporation because you're already taking the loss if you're materially participating. You put the money in, you have basis. If you didn't have basis, then maybe it would unlock it. But yeah, that's getting ticky tacky. All the accountants out there all of a sudden just go, what? You're taking the basis? That's cool. So um, here's the easiest way to look at it. If you lose money in the corporation, in a corporation you had to put money in, you are going to get that loss somehow, some way. If it's a C corporation, if it is a LLC taxed as a C corporation, then it stays capital loss, which you still get to write off, but capital losses offset capital gains with the exclusion of you can write off up to $3,000 a year mm -hmm. of excess capital loss against your ordinary income. So, mm, right? Yeah, so, mm. Yes. Yes. So mm. a, quick, a quick example is me and my wife invested half a million dollars into this cor our corporation. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it's a franchise. And it's just not working. So we shut it down. Well, because we have that 1244 provision that you talked about, when we file a return jointly, mm -hmm. we're going to be able to write off $100,000 or near losses. No limitations or anything. The rest of it, though, so if you lost a half million, yep. you get to take a, ha a hundred thousand against your ordinary income. So your W-2 income, just think of that. Like if you make if you make a, a good salary, it offsets that. Then you have $400,000 of additional capital loss. Which right? can be a bad thing if you don't have any other investments to write off. Could be a good thing if you do have, uh, heck, if I have a rental property that's appreciated significantly, I may just dump Wipe that puppy. Right. There's, there, it, it, I think the moral of the story is it pays to have an accountant that understands the, this type of principle, but you just have to know match it with the type of income and then are there exceptions? So like passive loss is offset passive income and there's two exceptions, uh, you know, uh, real estate professional and active participation. Uh, with capital loss, capital loss is limited to $3,000 and then there's a few little uh, exceptions. The big one is the 1244 stock loss, right? And then 1202 is the uh, untaxed gain. So yeah, 1244 yep. stock loss. But you have to make, it has to be a C corp not an LLC tax as a C corp, has to be an S corp, or can't be an LLC tax as, a, as an S corp. And you have to make the election to be treated under 1244. We do that as a matter of course here, not because we don't trust you guys that you would do it, but it's because we don't trust you guys that you would do it. No, I'm just teasing. We just, we just throw it in on everyone because we figure in case you have loss, uh, it's, you, you know, let's not add injury to insult. Let's offset your other income. So. Yeah, one thing I wanted to mention that you, you brought up earlier was if you're making any kind of decision like shutting down your corporation or selling this or that, it's not a bad idea to ask 
throw in a platinum question, say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. What are the possible red flags or tax consequences? That's what platinum is for, right? So if you're a platinum member with Anderson, just go in there and ask, and that way they can look at it. And now you're moving some of that, you're shifting the liability onto us. So hopefully our guys answer it correctly, right? If not, at least you have somebody you can hold, hold to account. Um, and we are happy to play that role for you. Um, I jointly own an inherited property that is currently on the market. So it sounds like somebody passed away, went through probate or went through a trust and you inherited a piece of property. Can the expenses that I have, utilities, staging, maintenance, repairs, taxes, be added to the cost value? This is one we talked about and, and the answer is really, it depends uh, on how the property was being used once you inherit it. Uh, you could have been using it personally, mm -hmm. you could have been renting it out, or it could just be sitting there. So let's say that I inherited a property and I jointly did this. So mm -hmm. maybe it's a uh, mom and dad passed away and they left it to Jeff and I and we're brothers. Mm -hmm. And we have these expenses. So maybe the estate's paying the expense or maybe I'm having to pay for it. Like maybe there's nothing else in there. Mom and dad just left us a property. and We have to sell it. You get a step up in basis. So you're not going to have any gain, but you have to next couple months, I got to fix it up and get it ready for sale. And it had to go through the probate process. In some states like California, that's a six month holding period where you got to just sit on this thing. So you have utilities, I got to keep the electricity on, I got to keep the um, you know, water, I got to keep gas going. Now I have to bring in someone to stage it to make it look pretty. I got to maintain the place. I got to fix what's busted and I have to pay the property taxes. The property taxes, I would assume I could write that off even if it's personal, right? Even if it's personal, like even if I yes. lived in it, I, I could write that off. Yes, you could. And then we get back into the whole limitation on taxes argument whether you have a, the, the, right. the ten thousand dollars a year but, but the, go ahead but the utilities staging maintenance and repairs that all sounds like utilities sounds like i'm done i can't do anything unless i made this into a rental property and had utilities is yeah. there any way i could write off utilities i think if it was just an investment property any expenses incurred to maintain this at its value would be you'd be able to add into basis mm -hmm. and i've seen this done However, if you are using it personally, you or the brother in this case. Yes, say that. Yeah, So-and-so passed away and we're living there. Uh, and I don't think in this case it matters if it's you or him. It's going to have the same result either way. Right. Is you're not going to be able to deduct these utilities, uh, repairs, and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, is it personal use or am I... Um, or is this for an investment? And if it's mm -hmm. for an investment, it sounds like I may get a deduction. I may not get to write it. It wasn't actually made available for rent. Well, I guess I, I possibly could create a little bit of a loss out of it. Yeah, but... whether it's an active investment or an idle investment. Hmm. So, the, so it sounds like this is gonna be facts and circumstances. Mm -hmm. You may be able to add these things, even if you had it as a loss and you weren't able to take the deduction because you didn't have any other passive income. So let's say this was an investment property, then uh, you could still take that loss and it offsets any gain, adds to basis. But we just had to step up in basis anyway. Like right. I'm, I'm wondering whether it would even matter. So I guess the more and more I'm looking at this, the more I'm leaning that unless it's appreciated significantly since the decedent passed away, chances are these are just going to be. Yeah, I'm of the opinion that you can probably include staging as a closing cost. However, when you add in some of the other closing costs, like broker fees and but stuff you, like that. You don't have any gain. So what are you going to write it up? Well, that's that's what I'm saying is when you sell this property, you're probably going to have a loss. But it's a personal loss then, right? So you wouldn't be able to write it off. Again, it depends on what type yeah. of property it is. Yeah. So you'd have like, you know, so the best thing for these folks is probably to get it on the market and rent it out for a little bit and see if you can't at least turn it into a rental property. Otherwise you're probably going to be eating those expenses, but maybe the estate pays it, you know, that's the mm -hmm. thing is hopefully there's other assets. It's not straightforward. And that's why you would sit down with somebody and map it out. I'm wondering if anybody in chat has had to deal with it. We always have CPAs on guys that, that, uh, that, that watch these. So has anybody dealt with that out there in CPA world or accountant world? that's dealt with this issue. 
that uh, that has anything to add, I'll watch the chat while we go to the next one. And, and you know, sometimes it's better to just not close the estate, not distribute the property, have the estate sell it because they're still going to get the step up. Mm -hmm. and, and then do you have the cash to distribute as you please? Yeah. So they're making it sound like uh, can the expenses that I have, realistically, the estate should be paying, but they're being forced to pay it. Uh, not uncommon. Hey, here's your inheritance. Here's your property. And then you're like, great. Now what the hell am I supposed to do with it? I got to maintain it. I got to fix it. I got to do all these things. Yep. Those are out of your pocket. One of the better things you could do is turn it into a, a, an investment property. So at least those losses could potentially be taken. So I guess another factor in this is who actually owns this property? The it, brothers or does the estate still technically own it? It says I don't jointly own an inherited property. Okay. So the estate distributed it. Uh, Somebody says the right, I'm not a CPA, but the right thing to do is get reimbursed from the estate. That would seem to be what I would say. And usually I think what Jeff just said is that the estate might sell it, but it sounds like they distributed it to these folks and now they have it. And that's one of those things that sometimes the uh, attorneys are just doing what attorneys do and the accountants are left out in the cold. If the accountant came in there and talked to them, they might say, hey, estate, just sell it and then distribute the proceeds. How about mm -hmm. that? You still get the step up, but they didn't. So probably it's going to be personal and you're going to eat those. But you inherited a house. Uh, at least it says property, right? Yeah, maybe it's a, you inherited a piece of land or whatever it is. Swamp in North Georgia. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so the true story, my dad inherited two lots in Alabama and the cost of probating them was more than the value of the lots. So like... It was always this thing. My grandma was always like, I got this land and I'm going to leave it to you guys and all that stuff. And then she passed away and left it. And he, was, he never even got it. And he was like, the lawyer's like, oh, it's just, this is going to be more expensive to open this thing and get this done. Just sign this quick claim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's just your state. You take it. All right. Uh, can I deduct expenses for working at home and what forms can I use? I don't remember that question. I don't remember that question either. Hmm. We'll start off with that depends. If you're an employee, no, there's no place to deduct. What's from home. last time? Somebody's, all right, we're going to have a chat with the slide creator. That was a repeat from last session. See? All right, who did the slides? Raise your hand. Um, we should still answer it since it's in front of us, though. And say, Patty, I'm going to say, well, at least she's accountable. Give her the stink eye. Jeff, can you give her stink eye? Wait, wait, wait. Patty. Uh, if you're an employee, no, there's no, there's no deduction anymore for uh, employee work expenses. That is right. You, 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 we lost miscellaneous itemized deductions in the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act. You need to have a business to write those things off. And if you have a business, a C-Corp, an S-Corp, an LLC taxes a C-Corp, an LLC taxed as a S-Corp or a nonprofit, they could reimburse you for the administrative use of your home. Otherwise you're eating it. And if your employer doesn't pay it, you're kind of, no, 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 no. All right, now let's go on. Hey, this looks like the right slide. Oh, this is the sale would be capital gain and loss if it wasn't used personally. So you can treat those carrying expenses as selling expenses or basis. So Tanya's coming to the rescue. Thank you. All right. We got rock stars out there. Yes, Patty, this is great. This is a perfect slide. My wife's father wants to sign his house over to us and to her brother. What could go wrong? Right? What I, I had to read that first <laughs> sentence two or three times. I know. Oh. So here, I'm going to leave the house to my, yeah, to the family. He says us, but I have a feeling that dad's going to leave it to his, his daughter. daughter. Yeah, <laughs> you're, there's no us in this. Dad's like, yeah, let me just leave it to uh, to my. I'm my, familiar with this word. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we would not do that, just so you know. Like, there would be no us. It would be to his daughter and his was to his descendants um what tax advantage is that for dad let's just answer that one there's no. really no tax advantage other than he doesn't have to pay real estate taxes anymore yep and he's using up his lifetime exclusion of 
what is it, 12,950,000 just and, for his side. And, and I do know some people just like to get out from under properties that they're not. Yeah, he's trying to saddle her. And, <laughs> you take this this dog. No, no, I'm just teasing. It's I probably... want to treat each of you evenly badly. <laughs> I'm going to give you my, this is this is your great grandfather. <laughs> nobody's been living in there you know for anyway all right so what tax advantage there isn't but he, there is a tax disadvantage yes and that is that when dad uh transfers that property over it's a gift mm -hmm. and when you gift a cap a, a appreciated asset uh you inherit or you receive the basis of the gift or so if dad gives you this property you just lost out on the step up and basis that occurs if dad passed and gave it to you. So we've seen this a number of times, rear its ugly head, when somebody is in a situation where they're getting older, they fear, they fear that the end is near and they transfer property to their children, they pass away uh, and they uh, end up missing out on millions of dollars of step up and basis. Actually, it was a a case in uh in ohio that i still remember that was four siblings dad owned a building in downtown like it was a really nice it was a city building millions of dollars and the tax impact was millions of dollars like it was many 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 millions of dollars and uh because he gifted it before he passed uh the children's basis was dad's basis which was next to nothing he'd owned it for 50 years and so they ended up with a, a huge tax hit when they sold it, as opposed to if dad just leaves it to you, uh, your basis would step up, uh, the basis of the property would step up to the fair market value when dad passes. So in English, let's say dad paid $100,000 for a property and now it's worth 500,000. If he gifts it to you guys, your basis is 100,000. If you sold it, you'd have $400,000 a gain. If dad passes away in, in in you inherit that property, your basis is five hundred thousand. You sell it, you pay zero gain. Um, so I would be one to say I would caution you against outright gifts. That said, if there's a reason to do it, like some states tax estates, Washington, Oregon, some of these places might have a really hefty estate tax, and so dad wants to. Um, get rid of a property out of that estate there might be a compelling reason to do that maybe there's not a lot of gain maybe he's only owned it for a little period of time uh maybe that would justify it or sometimes people will do something like they'll sell it they do an asset freeze mm -hmm. where they say hey you buy it at fair market value on an installment sale maybe dad lived in it as his primary residence so there's not a tax hit on the capital gain and now your basis is stepped up but you do have to pay for it like he could always gift you money every year to pay for it but you do have to report it as though you're paying the principal and interest uh every year like he's going to have imputed interest even if you don't pay it um so there are some issues uh anything else you want to throw on there um transfer tax can rear its sometimes ugly head some states have hefty transfer taxes some states don't pennsylvania um like three percent oh and one thing i i sometimes hear is well, my dad's in poor health. He's afraid he's going to have to go into a nursing home and he doesn't want somebody taking his house to pay for it. I know Medicaid has a five-year five look-back period. I'm not sure what the look-back is for Medicare. They're about uh, the same, I think. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I know that it's a five-year look-back period. And then uh, bankruptcy, it could be 10 years. So if if my father transfers his house to me and then goes into a nursing home, say, four years later, they're going to look at what assets he had before that. And there can be penalties, by the way, yeah. if you do transfer an asset that you then, uh, then uh, owing to, to somebody else so that you qualify. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some pretty hefty penalties. So you do this again. I, I hate to sound like a broken record, but you're going to have somebody who's actually going to research it and make sure that you're doing this the, the appropriate way. As for how you would hold it, depends on what you're going to use it for. If you guys are moving yeah. in it, like maybe you already live there. Um, and you're just changing ownership, but the, the, the living arrangements are staying the same. Um, you may not have to do much of anything. You may just take it in the name, like I would say at a minimum, do it as a trust. Uh, but if it's an investment property between you and your brother, uh, or, you know, her, your wife's brother, 
uh, so your brother-in-law, then I'd probably be looking at doing some sort of LLC and having some uh, mechanism in the event there's disputes so that uh, uh, Ty, you know, Ty doesn't go to runner, you know, that you guys actually have a mechanism for uh, for handling things should they not agree on the way the property is right. being held. And, and I was going to bring that up that sometime, even with close family, y'all don't always agree on everything. Really? Yes. You're my brother, you know. Yes. All right. Brother from another mother. When you have a C Corp, no income at this point. A Wyoming LLC that owns two LLCs with rentals, which entity pays general expenses like membership, cell phone, education, internet, et cetera. I wasn't exactly sure what we meant by membership. I'm guessing some kind of subscription. Maybe platinum. Yeah. Oh, that that's a good one. Yeah, uh, or something like that. Actually, for the ones listed here, I think I pay them all through the corporation. I would too. Yeah. So here's here's how it works is when you have a the the LLCs with rentals and you have a um, C Corp at that point. Um it looks like you have a Wyoming LLC that owns two LLCs. So you have the Wyoming LLC managed by the C-Corp and you pay the C-Corp a management fee. That simple. C-Corp then covers all the expenses. So the C-Corps can write off the cell phone, administrative office for the home. Don't leave that one out. Don't leave out two at EA, bunch of tax-free money. Um, memberships, you can pay anything that's, that's reasonable for the management company which expands your ability to write things off because it's not just real estate. It's the operating of an entity and those entities own real estate. So a family corporation, just like a family office, it's there's, there's expenses that you get to, that might be something like this. Like let's just say, Hey, I have this cell phone as an individual. I can't write this puppy off. Even as a sole proprietor, I can only write off the portion that I use for business. But if it's a, if I'm an employee of an organization and that means it has to be taxed as a corporation. So S Corp, C Corp, LLC tax as an S Corp, LLC tax as a C Corp or a nonprofit organization, then it can reimburse me 100%. So even if I'm already incurring the expense, if it's coming out of my pocket, I can get reimbursed. And that starts moving money that would have been taxable into the realm of no longer being taxable. And it doesn't show up on your return anyway. So uh, that's what I'd be doing. Yeah, now there's a bit of a balancing act that goes on with a management fee because ideally you want your management fee to cover all these expenses. Yep. However, you also have to look at, is the management fee reasonable for the revenue they're collecting uh, from your LLCs? So if you're only collecting $10,000 in revenue, you, you of course can't write off Five to ten thousand dollars in management fees. You could because it could be guaranteed. I mean, how many times have we had that come up in audit? We've been doing this a long time. I'm trying to think. I've never had it questioned under audit. I'm just thinking, like, I'm. A, yeah. Have you ever seen it where they actually like? Oh, that seems like too much. I don't seem to audit rental properties. At Almost all. never. It was point zero five percent last year for partnerships, and for S corps, it was point zero five percent audit rate last year too. Compare that to the typical, per, you know, regular people, it's 0.2%. And if you're under $25,000, it's 0.8%. And if you're an S, if you're a sole proprietor, it's 1.6%. If you're making over hundred grand, 1.4, if you're over 200,000, like there's really high audit risk. Or if yeah. you're over uh, $10 million, you're in a really high <laughs> audit rate. But they you, they you like the low hanging fruit and with like a rental entity, Almost every expense is going to be document easily documented. Yeah, and this is simple. Like, what are they going to say? They, like, their only argument is that it's not reasonable. In which case, they got to go out and show that there's no property managers out there ch charging. And this isn't even a property manager. This is how much could I pay someone to manage my portfolio of LLC? So if I to manage my company, so I go get an employee. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to tell me that ten thousand dollars is too much. To hire a manager to manage in a, a business? No. And, w and we sometimes see that with clients who have a third-party property manager and still have a corporation. Well, the corporation's not managing the day-to-day -day property. They're managing that underlying entity, that LLC, the holding company, or whatever it may be. So mm -hmm. that's where that management fee is coming from. Yep. Good question. And uh, yeah, I would run it through the court.
Now, you don't have to run it through the corp, technically. You don't get the same benefits. Like if I have a C corp, I can write off 100% of my medical, dental, vision expenses. I can just reimburse myself. Anything that comes out of pocket, even if I have my an employer-sponsored plan, if I have co-pays or deductibles, I get to write those off. Or if I have something that insurance won't cover, I get to write that off. I'll take that action all day long. All right. How does paying your child under 18 help with tax, if any? This is what we call basically income shifting. Mm -hmm. We're shifting it from you who is likely, hopefully in a higher tax bracket than your underage child. Uh, and, and you can do that. They can invest in an IRA or a Roth IRA or mm -hmm. uh, pretty much so they're not paying any tax on this income. If they're under 18 mm -hmm. and it's out of your partnership entity, so let's go back to this one. Let's say that the kids are working for the LLCs. Mm -hmm. They're doing advertising. They're doing the posting pictures. They're taking photos. They're doing the tech stuff. If you pay them, you don't even have to do employment taxes. So we're talking about uh, workers' comps, state and federal unemployment. Old age disability survivors, oh, yeah. Medicare. Which is the big one. Yep. All of those, you don't have to do any of that. And you don't have to do withholding on them because there's no tax owed. If they're less than $13,850, zero. They go above that, there's gonna be some tax, but you you know, but again, it's, it's, it's gonna be minuscule. It depends on how much you're paying them if they're under 18. Like don't be giving them $100,000 a year, but if you're giving them $15,000 a year to cover the cost of their tuition or clothes or other expenses, it might be tax-free. So I pay my minor child, uh, say twelve thousand dollars. Yeah, um, they don't even have to. Do I don't want partnership. Yeah, I I deduct that whole twelve hundred dollars. Twelve thousand dollars. I don't have to pay any payroll taxes on it. Zero. Gets to them the stand their standard deduction more than covers that twelve. They don't even have to do a tax return. So I mentioned IRAs, but in this case, I think you would probably go with a Roth IRA. I would go with a Roth IRA under those circumstances because then they'll never pay tax on the portion of the money. Like then you're going to be like, hey, I don't care. I'll pay for their stuff because they just put 6,000 or 6,500 bucks or whatever it is this year into a Roth IRA and they will never, ever pay tax on that money or the growth ever again. And here's the deal. If they put let's just say that they put $5,000 a year into a Roth and they do that for four years and then they go to college and they need money. That money's not locked away. They can take the contribution out at any time tax-free. So let's say that you did this for four years and you had $20,000 in a, in a Roth and they had an expense. Oh my gosh, I need to, I need to pay for, you know, uh, 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 my last semester of tuition and it's 10 grand. I could take 10 grand out, knock that thing out, and it doesn't hurt me at all. Now, the growth, the appreciation that's occurred in that, so let's say I put 20 in there, now it's worth 30. The $10,000 of appreciation I can't touch, or I'll have penalties, mm -hmm. uh, unless you have a reason, like first-time home buyers, medical emergencies, things like that. There's some, there's some ways to even get that money out without penalty. But um, long and short of it is, Roth IRA under those circumstances works like magic. It's fantastic. Now, there's a new provision that doesn't really have anything to do with this, uh, but you made me think about it. It's the 529 plan. Mm -hmm. um, you contribute to your child's 529 plan for 17, 18 years. They never go to school. There is a new provision under Secure 2.0 yeah. that will allow you to convert that 529 plan into a Roth IRA. Crazy, but... We'll let it go rough. I, I, I'm pretty sure if anybody in the tax world knows that I'm wrong, please let me know. Yeah. Where does the uh, 529 plan go into? I, th I knew that you could, because you didn't pay tax on the way, right. like you didn't get a deduction. So it seems like it would be a Roth. You could put that into a Roth. That'd be like, mm. oh yeah. Because you it's could put huge. an unlimited amount in 529s. Um, You're not capped, are you? Most people, no. most people don't exceed the annual gift. I, I know the ABLE accounts are capped. Somebody says they think the limit is like 32000 Okay. Something to look at. Maybe next time we'll, we'll do a little research on it. Um, we'll write our own question. No, we'll just, we'll just make sure. We'll figure this out. I'll see if any other accountants respond. We're not omnipotent. We are a community that uh, 
we just try to make the best decisions we can with the with our limited noggins. I am all, I am all knowing. I know all the stuff that I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anything that I don't know. That's that, <laughs> apparently that's my problem. All right. Can you benefit from cost segregation at any time? Example, after 25 years on a 27 and a half year property as an extreme, what is the downside to doing it sooner than later, given bonus depreciation is reducing annually at this point and will go away entirely? Well, if you convert this 27 and a half property, any part of it to 1245 property, so we're basically saying 15 years or less. I know it's supposed to be 20 years or less, but. Um, Hold up for a second. Aaron says, I'm a college admissions expert, about $500,000, 529 plan contribution limits. But what what can we roll over into the, uh, what can we roll over into a Roth? Starting 2024, 529 account holders will be able to transfer up to a lifetime limit of 35,000 to a Roth IRA for a beneficiary. Okay, there we go. We have smart people out there. Thank you, guys. Thank you. That's Douglas and uh, what was, I scroll back up, it was in Aaron. Thank you guys for responding. And remember, you can also uh, move any excess uh, funds to a different beneficiary. Oh, yeah. You could put it to somebody else or somebody more deserving. And I think you could you could just use it too. like you could take it out. But I think you have a tax. You have it. Then it becomes taxable. Yeah. So if you don't want to pay tax, then you can just make sure that it's rolling over to somebody else. It becomes taxable, not on what you contribute it, but the gain on it. Mm -hmm. Kind of like because you never paid tax on the on the one. right. So you always can take that back out. Yay. And then the, 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 somebody is coming out with a big long one. Uh, 529 plan has to be open for at least 15 years. The beneficiary of the account should not change, but you can name yourself as a beneficiary. The maximum allowed to be rolled to a Roth IRA is $35,000. I would not roll it to me or make myself beneficiary because I don't want to go back to school. I don't want to go back to school either. <laughs> Somebody else, we could punish them. They have to go back to some of these wackadoodle colleges. I don't even know what they're learning there anymore. All right, let's go. Uh, can you benefit from, my dad gave me this, my dad sat me down again, true story. And he said, <clears throat> Toby, college isn't for everybody. You're pretty good at painting houses. You should stick to that. I was like, well, what? <laughs> and I never applied to college. I got in, uh, luckily I was good at soccer and somebody said, hey, you should come play here. And I was like, really? Okay. That was, a, that was it. Otherwise I'd probably be painting houses to this day. Who knows? Life is strange. All right. Can you benefit from cost segregation at any time? Uh, all right. We already answered. We asked that question. You were about to answer it. So what's the downside to doing? Well, the, the longer you wait, and in this extreme case of 25 years, there's nothing really left to depreciate hardly. Uh, your 1245 property has probably already been fully depreciated under this scenario i guess you you made the point that you, know, you might be able to take that little bit and divide it up between the different properties and see i'm looking at it like so cost segregation is a fancy way of saying doing it right so if you buy a house and i'm sorry i'm going to probably offend a few people but if you buy a house and you treat it all as 27 and a half year property not the land we know the land you can't depreciate but the mm -hmm. box that's on the land and you treat it all as 27 and a half year property, you're not supposed to do that. They let you do that because it benefits the treasury because a dollar today is worth more than a dollar in five years. A dollar today is worth more than a dollar in 10 years. And a dollar today is definitely worth more than a dollar in 27 and a half years. But they'll let you do that if you want to, they'll say, okay, spread it out, the whole thing. Don't break it out into its components. Uh, the, there's personal property in there. There's appliances, countertops. There's removable flooring. There's land improvements. You know, that fence you put up and all the shrubs you put in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. 27 and a half years seems fine by us, right? They let you do that, but it's not the methodology you really should be using. A cost seg is breaking it and saying, here's my five-year property. Here's my seven-year property. 
here's my 15 year property and here's my 27 and a half year property. The ratio between those is usually about 30 to 40% between five, seven and 15 year and about 60% that's sitting over there in the 27 and a half year property. So let's go to this question. And they're saying, hey, what if you wait 25 years? So you've written everything off 25 of the 27 and a half. So you have two and a half years left on everything. If you did a cost seg, your five-year property, you, yeah, okay, I can write off whatever that extra two and a half years right now. My seven-year property, same thing. My 15-year property, same thing. Really tiny benefit, if any. And the cost of the cost seg is going to exceed it, right? They're not free. And unless this is a $100 million property, it's probably not going to be worth it. Um, I don't really look at cost segs and think of downside because what you're doing is you're doing what you're supposed to do and you're getting the dollar today instead of waiting, you know, decades. And if I can get that dollar today, I always want the dollar today. Mm -hmm. I don't want it in five years. I don't want it in seven years. I don't want it in 15 years. And I definitely don't want it waiting for 27 and a half years. So when you do a cost seg, that's, that's step number one. Step number two is, do I bonus depreciate that? Because anything less than 20 years, I can write off up to 100% of it, uh, depending on what year you put the property in service. It'll dictate um, what the amount is. So right now, if you bought a property in 2023 and you did a cost segregation and you broke it down, let's say I bought a half a million dollar house, let's say a hundred of that was land, Throw that away. So I have $400,000 of, of depreciable basis. Let's say 120 of that is five, seven, 15 year property. I could write off 80% of that 120 right now. Mm -hmm. And that would be $96,000 off the top of my head. So I would get a $96,000 deduction right now. What is that worth to me? Depends on your circumstances, right? If you have other rental or... You know, do you have other passive income? Like all these things I can wipe out with this big fat deduction. I'm a real estate professional. I can write off the thing against my W-2. Am I an active participant in real estate? Then I could write off up to $25,000. So all of a sudden I'm accelerating my deduction and it gets me my money back quicker. It means I'm not paying tax this year and I can put those dollars that I save Again, a dollar today is worth more than five, you know, a dollar in five years. It gives me those dollars today so I can continue to grow. And I know one of the companies we work with, Cost Sec Authority. Yeah. Uh, you go to them, you give them the exact scenario. They're going to tell you before they charge you a dime if this makes sense or not. Yep. Yeah. That's if they, you work through us, we'll give you a link. They do it. And it's, yeah, can the depreciation deduction be carried forward? Your passive loss can be carried forward until you destroy, until you get rid of the property or until you have other passive income. And when you get rid of the property, this is what gets weird. You actually have, like, let's say you sell a property and I have these passive losses floating around. You know that when you sell a passive activity, the capital gains are actually considered passive. So you can wash those with the, uh, wipe those out with your passive loss carry forward from your other real estate, like so, there's so many ways. I just look at it saying, I want to write it off now. Unless there's a good reason not to, you're going to have to, you're going to have to convince me not to. I just want to see how much of a benefit. And so we've had plenty of clients where the benefit was six figures. The benefit was, you know, strong, uh, you know, uh, five figures and it didn't cost them, you know, cost them three grand and they, they saved 50. So they're like, yeah, give me that. Give me that. I have $47,000 in my hand that I otherwise wouldn't have that now I can go out uh, and and do other things with. Fun stuff. Sorry, I just go off on that one. And I know I'm being slow today. Uh, tax and Asset Protection Workshop. We already talked about this a little bit, but just if you want to learn about land trusts, LLCs, corporations, trader tax, sometimes, uh, actually dealer tax, wholesaler tags and how depreciation works. And I'll give you some cost seg examples. Then come to the one day virtual events. 
uh, we also had the four day live event and you mentioned cost seg authority. Eric Oliver always comes out and gives a presentation on cost segregations. And again, if you're an Anderson person, uh, they'll do your uh, analysis for free. They'll tell you what the deduction is going to be before you even uh, pay them a dime. And that way you can decide whether or not it makes sense. And by the way, you can make these deductions. Like you can make this election up until you file your tax return plus extensions. So if it's you individually, you have page one, schedule E, property on there, you could be making that cost seg election all the way up until October 15th. We were doing it. And on a few people, it saved their bacon. A um, yep. number of people you know, wrote in this first year. I know, I know one client in particular was zero tax. They're like, I cannot believe it because they're a real estate professional. And, you know, they went from paying a lot of tax to paying a little in tax simply because they retired and utilized the benefit of the tax code to make them some extra money. Yay. We like that. Okay. Jeff, yes, we, we need to move from a sole proprietor to, to some form of business entity. I'm an active trader doing well. I want to protect my account as well as provide the best solution for retirement contributions and charitable contributions. C-Corp, something else, fully happy breaking even or leaving money in the court for future, for future purposes. What do you think? Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of the whole professional trader in securities. <laughs> Because they, they have like a 5% success rate. There's a lot of landmines out there. And you may be part of that 5%. But as the guys that do the taxes, like even some of the great groups that are out there, thousands of people and everybody is blah, blah, blah. We're all killing it. 80% lose money. So uh, kind of disregarding his last couple of questions because they are important. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing really well as a trader, I don't think, I want to be a trader. I think I want to have those as capital gains. Right. So, well, so here's, here's the rule. There is no such thing as trader under the code. <laughs> so there's a publication on it. And I have to have regular, frequent, and extensive trading, catching the daily movements of the market. Here's the rules. Are you ready? Golden rules. Uh, golden rule number one is it's really tough to do this if you have a W-2 job. Uh, and you got to hold for less than 30 days, period, full stop. You're, if, you're, if your average hold period is, is more than 30 days, you're not a trader. Um, at least 750 trades a year, I would say, is, is, is a good number. And you need to be trading about 75% of the trading days. Otherwise, you're not frequent enough. So there's a lot of court cases. They're all over the place on it. But they come down very consistently. That's That 30-day average hold is a bright line test. Boom, you're out. Uh, you take too many vacations, boom, you're out. It's not how you make your living. It's not substantial. It's not like, again, if, you, if you're less than a $25,000 account, don't even think about it. But here's the deal. I don't like trader. I don't want to be a trader. Trader, they like to audit everybody because it's facts and circumstances. And then they apply the facts and circumstances, which, you know, it's the old adage, like, what do you call a, an attorney with an IQ over 70? Your honor, right? You have to go in front of a judge and you don't want to <laughs> and you don't want to be paying the freight to go get that opinion. So the reason people do it is because an investor, let's say that Jeff is not a trader and he has a bunch of expenses. He can't write them off because he's an investor. He doesn't get to write those off. He goes to he goes to some seminars, he goes to some workshops. He has all the, he pays to be part of a bunch of groups. He subscribes to a bunch of stuff. Doesn't get business deductions. He's toast. How about his home office? No, he can't. Now me as a trader, I say, I am trader. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Now I get to write those off and I write them off of my schedule C, mm -hmm. but my income all goes on to my schedule D, which is where my capital gains are. And you guys look at me like, oh, I don't even know what that means. Schedule C is where you have an active business, but there's no income. Schedule D is where capital gains go, but you don't have expenses. So you're writing your expenses off over here and putting the income over here. You're, you may as well just say, please audit me. Please ask me what the hell I'm doing. So uh, that's number one. Number two, if you want to write off the losses from your trading, which a lot of people do because trading is inherently risky and more often than not, people lose money at it, especially the newbies. 
you got to be very careful. You got to learn. There's a learning curve in this. You don't just go throw $300,000 at it and hope something good happens. That's called gambling. And I li we live in Las Vegas. We know what happens when people gamble. They keep building billion dollar buildings. The font in blue is what? $3.2 billion. Where do you think they, how do you think they're paying for that? It's not because the, uh, the shrimp cocktails are so good. It's because people are gambling. They're doing all this stuff and they're losing money. They're passing it on. But the reason people do trader status is because then they do something else. They make a mark to market election so they can write off their losses, which is even more asinine. You treat everything like you sold it on December 31st, even if you didn't, which I've seen people blow themselves up this way too, because stocks go up at the end of the year, they go down, tax time, you sell the stock, you can't even cover the tax on it. And you have to let your broker know that you have made a mark to market and election. You to, and you have to do it the year prior, right? So anyway, there's, there's all this nonsense. So here's the way to do it with no nonsense. You ready? You take, let me see if I can actually write this up. I'll make it really simple. This is super simple. You take your brokerage account. Oops. I thought it was simple. Pen. Which doesn't want to write. Oh, this is great. I think you're out of vein. Oh, there you go. Caught up with you. Chimney Christmas. This thing. All right. So maybe we can draw. Yeah, it's a little late. So there's money. This thing has a big delay on it for some reason. I can't see what I'm writing. There we go. So you're going to put your cash in this guy right here. And Matt, we're going to have to restart this computer at some point because this thing's just, it won't show me what I'm drawing. I don't think it's been restarted since 2022. Yeah. Okay. So we put money into the, to an entity. This is going to be an LLC. And we have you be an 80% owner and the corporation be a 20% owner. And the reason we're doing that is because if it makes money, 20% of those profits flows into the corp. And now it can do things like pay you a salary into a retirement plan. Like you could defer the whole thing into a 401k. Let's say that you make, hey, I made 50 grand, 10 of it flows into the corp. You could pay yourself out 10 grand, yet the employment taxes. So probably closer to eight into, the, into a 401k if you wanted to. Or you just use all that money to write off your expenses. And you do the 280A, the administrative office for the home, cell phone, computer, get your kids involved, get everybody involved and start just wiping out that extra 20% so that you just lowered your tax bill. That is perfectly fine. And now we're not sitting here dealing with this trader status because what is the corporation doing? It's not trading. It is managing an LLC, which nobody's ever argued that a corporation can't manage an LLC. So you shifted 20% of the income over to the corp. Is there any way to shift more money over to the corp? It's interesting you ask that, right? We do a guaranteed payment to partner and we pick an amount that is not has nothing to do with the profit. So you could have, like, let's say that you knew that you needed to get an extra $25,000 over to that corp. You would just say, all right, I will manage this. I would probably add some real estate entities into it or other type of investments or possibly another bit line of business into the corp. It could be a side gig. It could be something, but I'd have the corp doing more activities. And then you could pay that as well. And it comes off the top. In other words, you're not deducting it as an individual. What it's doing is it's reducing the amount of tax that you owe by reducing the amount of income that's actually going on to your return. Yeah. So your return doesn't say I made $100,000, then here's my expenses. It just shows you made, let's say there's 100 and, and 50 of it went to the corp. It shows that you made 50 and it's still capital gains. So it doesn't mess it up. You don't get weird surprise taxes. You don't have mark to market elections and all that fun stuff. This is the strategy that I prefer. Now I have this on the YouTube channel. It's how to, how to structure a trading business. I think it's still floating around out there. So I, there's only 700 videos on that site, but if you type in trader, I'm sure you'll see how to structure a trading business. It's one of the more popular videos that, that we put out. So you can just sort by, uh, by the most popular videos and it's gonna be in the top, top 10 somewhere. Uh, but that'll explain it out too. I know, we're already late. I was gonna ask a question, but let's move on. Uh, I currently own a home in Oregon. 
I'm looking to purchase an investment property in another state and plan on using an LLC or S Corp. Do not use the S Corp. Let's just make that clear. Do not own a piece of property that you're going to live in or that you're going to use as, as an investment property in S Corp. You take it out to refi it, you're going to get hit with a tax event for all that appreciation as, as, as wages. It sucks. Um, I eventually would like to make my investment property, my primary residence, and my current residence, Oregon, an investment property. What would be the easiest way to go about this? So for me, the easiest way to go about this is not buy the Arizona property and make it an investment property. I'd buy the Arizona property and make them my primary. I, I would skip the delay, the extra steps, if possible. Buy the Arizona property, make that my primary residence, and then make my Oregon property the rental property. Yeah, I mean, I hear what you're saying. So but, let's say they're buying an investment property and eventually they say they like to make it my investment property. So they're going to, maybe it's going to be three or four years down the road, right? Yeah. You just buy that Arizona property. I would use a land trust and an LLC if there's going to be debt. If there's not going to be debt, then I might just use the LLC. Uh, I'd make it part of a structure so that you don't own an Arizona LLC, but you own a Wyoming entity that owns the uh, Arizona LLC. Don't worry, this isn't going to hurt you in the future uh, because you can always just distribute that Arizona LLC out to yourself if you're going to own it as a pr as a primary residence. Um, and then you use it as a investment property and wait. The Oregon property, I'm probably going to own that in a personal property trust. Uh, we call it a, a personal residence trust just to keep your name off of it. Uh, we don't need to do anything else until you make it into an investment property. Once you make it into an investment property and you move out, then I would still use an LLC. Uh, the thing to know that when you're in Oregon and or any state and you leave a personal residence that you've lived in as your principal place of business or as your principal home, um, if you've lived in it two of the last five years, you could exclude up to $500,000 of capital gain if you're married. So if you are looking at this situation, I don't want to lose that. So I might leave the Oregon property. Um, and if I'm going to keep that puppy, I am going to be really tempted to sell it. And this is going to sound odd to an S corp at some point in the next three years to step up my basis uh, I would do it on an installment sale. I would elect out of the installment sale. I'd have zero tax. And now I have a step up in basis on that property so I can depreciate it even higher. And I didn't really think about that because that starts the clock on 121. Yeah, if I move out and I make it into an investment property, I have three years to sell it and still get my 121 exclusion. And get this. You could sell that. Let's say that you're two years in and your Oregon property is nice and tasty. It's, it's appreciated nicely. And you're thinking, I really don't like going up to Oregon anymore. I'd like to stay in Arizona. You could sell that Oregon property, get your 121 exclusion, and it, reinvest it in an Arizona property by doing a 1031 exchange. So you could 1031 out of Oregon into Arizona and uh, literally step up your basis and pay no tax on the sale of that property. Yes. Yes. If you want to keep it, you could actually do the, let's set up an S-corp and sell it to the S-corp. But you're going to walk, you're, like, you're going to want us guiding you through that transaction or somebody guiding you through that transaction because it's potent, but with all great tax strategies, there's some give and get, right? You got to make sure you don't step on a landmine. So we want to make sure that you are good. All right. If I invested $30,000 in a marketing class to start a marketing company, do I have to amortize it over 15 years to see any of it back? Uh, can it be a business investment and get it all back? So the only entity or person who can use this deduction is your C corporation. Uh, because here you're saying it's a new line of business for yep. you. You're learning to be marketing. So Sole proprietors out, partnerships out, S corp is out. Uh, but it can be a working condition fringe benefit on this C corporation, uh, which means they can reimburse you or have a shareholder loan in this case as a startup expense. Yeah, I'm assuming that they already did the marketing class. Mm -hmm. 
and then they set up the company. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, I did the marketing, I learned how to do it, I set up the company after. <laughs> I'm toast. I get to write off $5,000 mm -hmm. at right, the startup expense. And then I'm going to amortize what $25,000 over 15 years. Correct. So you don't lose it, but you're writing it off over uh, 15 years. Yeah. $25,000 over 15 years. Boo. You still get to write it off though. And if you close the company down here, accelerate that and write it all off. Um, if you have not taken the classes, this is where it gets fun. So let's say that you bought a marketing class. You have six months to go through this marketing class and you set up a company somewhere in between. Now we're looking at the value of what you've already completed. That's going to be part of the startup expense. Up to $5,000 is right off immediately. The rest is over 15 years. But everything beyond this point, the value of that class, mm -hmm. it could just reimburse you for it because now you've transferred the benefit to the corporation or to the business. And the business is saying, hey, this is helping you out in this marketing realm. Like, I need you to learn these skills. I need you to do more. So there are ways to do it. And Jeff is absolutely right. I'd probably be using a C-Corp under these circumstances to make sure the IRS doesn't have an avenue to come back at me. And, and I probably would document this somewhere saying, we need you to take this course in your situation where it happens after business yeah. formation. Yeah, you'd say, hey, this is what the company's doing. This is our line of business. You are helping our business by going and getting this because this is how it works. Uh, so when I was at CLU um, as an undergrad, I was sitting there and I was in a business class where there's all these MBAs from Boeing. Boeing was paying for their engineers to get MBAs. Yes. Me sitting in the same class, paying the same dollars, I can't write it off. Boeing can because it's making them a better, it's making them better at their position. Me, it's preparing me to do something new in life, to get a degree that, you know, is worthless until I do something with it, right? I wasn't getting my MBA. Uh, business degree, yay. So you can go to law school or I could go back and do accounting, right? Is 1245, this is the last question. So, hey, we need to- We're not too bad. Yes, only a little bit late. All right. We've done is, way worse. I know. We've done, we've done some. See, we always get a little reaction when we, when we play it. Sherry's counting. Sherry. All right. Is 1245 property subject to depreciation recapture if the rental property is sold with capital gain? So, so here's what happens. What is 1245 property? 1245 is your personal property. Uh, anything below 20 years, 20 years or below. 1250 is your structure. Right? 1250 is, yes, your real estate itself. The box. And 1245 is the stuff in the box, or land improvements, your driveway, your shrubs, your appliances, your countertops, specialty electric, mm -hmm. removable, like your blinds, your carpet, and your linoleum. So 1245 recapture works basically like, like this. I buy a tractor from my farm. I fully depreciate it. And three years after I buy it, I sell it to somebody else. Since it's fully depreciated, I have no basis, but I have a gain of say $10,000 on my tractor. That is subject to recapture up to the amount of gain. Up to the amount that I paid too, right? So like if I paid... 5,000 bucks for that tractor. Three yes. years later, I sell yes. it for 10,000 because COVID's going on. I have gain on that and I have recapture on that. Yeah, you can't you can't recapture any more than you depreciated to start with. So let's say I depreciated 5,000 bucks. Am I going to have to pay 5,000 bucks of recapture at ordinary tax? In the case of I sold it for $10,000, yeah, you're going to have to pay recapture on that. Yes. Yeah, so the easiest way to think about this, guys, is that when you have 1245, which is tangible property, you're going to pay ordinary income tax. So let's just, I bought a, you know, I bought a piece of equipment. I got a deduction at my ordinary rate and I can actually write it off against my ordinary income. Um, and then if I sell it and I have gain, I have to pay recapture up to the amount that I depreciated because it's like, hey, it's not fair. You wrote it off and now you're not going to have long-term capital gains because that's lower tax. 
we make you recapture if you could or did uh, depreciate it. Uh, 1250 property is the structure. And that one, they limit your recapture to 25%. So capital gains is up to 20%, recapture is up to 25%. So Congress wrote these weird rules so that you can't completely hose them. But here's what we do with rental properties. Mm -hmm. You've done a cost segregation. You have all this 1245 property, kitchen cabinets, flooring, on and on and on. When you sell your rental property, you're selling the box. You're selling the box. Are you selling any of that stuff that you just depreciate? But you're going to say, I, I got all these brand new kitchen cabinets I just put in five years ago. Well, you're abandoning those. Bye. Yeah, there's no capital gain. There's no gain on it. So the, there's no sales price. There's no gain on that property. Your sales and price is on the box. Do not put it in your purchase and say like, no. oh, I'm buying all the all the, uh, the, the, the land improvements and this, that, and the other. It, what you're really looking at is I don't have a tax so long as its useful life is over or it's going to be abandoned. So like if I sell a property and I, I have some carpet mm -hmm. in it and they're already like, no, we're, to we're tossing all that, then I'm not putting the carpet on the sale. So was that item sold? No. So if I wrote it all off, do I have recapture? No. There's no gain on it. I only have to do recapture if there's gain on that item. Right. So you want to make sure that it's specifically excluded. Don't don't screw that up. Tax Tuesdays, recordings. You can always go to my website. Website, how many videos are we up to? 669 videos. Uh, put one out about every few days so you can come out. Yeah, we've been doing this just for a minute. So you can always come out there and get lost. You can see, look at those fun ones. There's how to make your assets invisible and living trust 101 build endless passive income that's the most surprising video i've ever done i'll have to watch that one i actually i've watched it and i was like hey, it's pretty interesting because a year ago i was like what did i say it was uh the 70 30 rule 30 30 30 10 and lever and uh and i was like yeah it's actually it's concise it's easy to follow so it's got some pretty good views uh how to pay zero capital gains Yes, it's legal. Illegal. I always start off by saying, don't sell it. <laughs> it's the easiest way to not pay tax on your capital assets. Uh, and then reduce taxes at the tax and asset. I, that's not really a video. That's that's something everybody watches if they're going to come to the tax and asset protection event. All right. So there's that tax and asset protection workshop. By all means, pop on and uh, and sign up. They're free. You can learn all about great entities. If you have questions in between these events, by all means, send them in to Tax Tuesday and Anderson Advisors. And Elliot looks at them and grabs questions that Jeff and I have to answer. Or sometimes Elliot is sitting in this chair quite often too. Mm -hmm. Sometimes Troy, sometimes other people. But you guys do, everybody does a really good job. Been doing these for a long time. I forget what episode we are at, guys. What I think we're at like 209 or something like that. We're over that. 200, right? Yep. I have holes in my brain. 204. So Patty's other, oh, Elliot. Okay, so we've done 204. We've done over 200. So uh, we'll just keep doing them until somebody makes a stop. And uh, if you ever have questions, come on in and ask. We have a great team. So I wanted to say thank you to Amanda, Dutch, Troy, Tanya, Jared, anybody I'm missing, I apologize. There's Elliot, of course, uh, Patty, Matthew, the whole staff that comes in and answers the questions. There's folks answering on the YouTube channel as well. Thank you guys for joining us via YouTube if that's where you're at. We really appreciate you coming around. And if you know anybody that would benefit, by all means, invite them to the Tax Tuesday. We like to answer questions and we like to spread tax knowledge to the masses. So we, uh, um, it makes us feel good that uh, we could we can clear up some of the confusion that's out there and hopefully help some people. We uh, like making you smarter because it sometimes makes us a little smarter. Always. We learned something new tonight. And thank you for the folks that participated by answering questions. You guys rock. So good luck to you. We will see you. There's a couple of questions that are unanswered. Actually, there's 14. So we'll answer those. So what I'll do is I'll mute Jeff and I. Make us go away. And uh, if you're waiting on a question, don't leave. Stick around. We'll answer it. Make sure that we uh, that we get you a, a prompt response. And we will see you in two weeks. Thanks, guys.